Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jake's Take with Jacob Aishar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Aishar, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. So before we get started with our conversation today, if you're like, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. If you're, wa- if you're listening to this on the podcast form, please give us a five-star review and subscribe. We really appreciate it. I'm very excited to welcome my next guest today. She is an award-winning storyteller, change maker, and future weaver. She's the author of The Wrong Kind of Woman, Inside the Re- Our Revolution, This Man of the Gods of Hollywood, which received praise from The Atlantic, BBC, NPR, and The Washington Post. She's also the co-founder of the 51 Fund, an investment fund to finance films wi- written, directed, and produced by women. And she's also the star of the upcoming film, Bite Me. So please help me welcome Naomi McDougall Jones. <laughs> what an amazing intro. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome, Naomi. Thank you so much for taking time in your schedule to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time. All righty. So when did you get interested in performing? And how did that passion evolve into the desire to pursue a career in the entertainment industry? Um, so when did I get interested? When I was about four years old. <laughs> My mom tells a story that she took me to t- see the Nutcracker when I was four, and I stood up in the middle of the second act and said, I want to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> where does that come from? I have no idea. Um, but yeah, basically from then on, that was like my single fo- singular focus was to become an actress. Um, I went to college for it and then got out of college and um, started being an actress in New York City. And getting cast and stuff and working, but also becoming pretty disillusioned pretty fast with the roles available for women, which as you may have heard are horrible, <laughs> generally speaking. And so I uh, just, I, I started making films and writing films and producing films primarily initially to just, because I was so frustrated that the, the women on screen I was seeing didn't represent the complexity and fabulousness of the women that I knew in my life. Um, and saw it in the actual world. So, and then it's all just kind of snowballed from there. Awesome. So 2022 marks your fifth anniversary of your TED Talk, What It's Like to Be a Woman in Hollywood. Has the, in your humble opinion, has the entertainment industry improved helping female filmmakers since you gave that TED Talk? Why or why not? Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. So obviously the, the situation is somewhat better than it was then. Um, I gave the TED Talk a year before the Me Too explosion happened. Um, and so certainly the the national conversation that's happened since then um, has been very large and um, has certainly forced the studios and networks to at least uh, scramble to get better PR <laughs> around these things. Um, and of course, Me Too on the gender and Oscars so white on, on race. Um, And however, I will say that the studios have always been more concerned with the headlines um, and how they're being perceived than with foundational change. Um, So are things better than they were five years ago? Yes. Um, Are they as better as people, are they as good as people might feel they are? No. Um, And one example of this is that uh, last year, um, 18% of studio films were directed by women, which is like a record high. <laughs> it, like, but we'd never cracked like 9%, 10% before that. Um, so that's amazing, right? It's Is 18% anywhere close to what to the 51% of the population that are women? Nope. But it pro- progress, right? However, this year, as people's attention started to turn away from this issue, that number went back down to 12%. And you can actually see this historical cycle um, where there's a every once a generation, everybody goes, oh my God, there are no women in Hollywood <laughs> behind the scenes. And everyone gets really mad about it. And there's like this whole conversation and the studios go, ah, 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 we'll fix it, we'll fix it. We just didn't know, we didn't realize. And then they like do a couple things and then everybody turns away and the numbers backslide. So I just wanna say, we have to keep paying attention. <laughs> they're, they're not, they didn't discover that they had a women problem in 2017, right? They knew this, they just didn't care because they like being in power. Um, and uh, so we have to, We have, it, this is something we have to keep pushing hard on. And you also further uh, expressed it in your book, The Wrong Kind of Woman Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. So can you describe the writing process to my audience and the feedback that it received? Yeah, 
So um, like I said, I did my TED talk a year before uh, the Me Too hashtag um, went viral. And but when that hashtag went viral, my TED talk also went viral and a million people watched it in like three months. It was insane. Um, and at that time, I got offered the opportunity to write a book on this topic um, that suddenly everybody was paying attention to. Um, and so I'd never written a book before. I'd written plays, I'd written films, but I had to figure out how to write a book, um, which was wonderful. And I did over 100 hours of interviews with women and met mostly women and some men up up and down the film industry from the famous to the obscure to the got forced out of the industry um, and pulled together thousands of pages of data and, and research um, to try to figure out not just the degree to which women are excluded from Hollywood now and in the past, which is not hard to establish, right? Like there's, I mean, I do that. There's like, but a couple of pages of graph graphs sort of paints the picture of, of how bleak it is. But what I was interested in is, is how it is happening because it's kind of unbelievable. Like it sounds like a conspiracy theory when you say women are 51% of the population and they're directing at the time 5% of studio films. Like it sounds so absurd that people like come up with sort of explanations in their minds. Like, well, then maybe women just aren't as talented or they're not as good at this job or um, they don't want this job. Right? We've heard people say that. And none of those things are true. Um, so it's really important to understand like the sort of micro and macro mechanics of how an entire gender can get excluded from the powers of an industry. Um, and then the book goes on to look at, okay, well then what do we do about it? Like how does, how will change actually happen here? That's incredible. And you also received some incredible feedback. Um, like I mentioned earlier in our introduction, the Atlantic, BBC, NPR, and Washington Post, but also more recently, one of the biggest activists in Hollywood, Rose McGowan, also took a liking to that book. So what's the feel to have her, not only her backing, but also some of these powerhouse media players recognize your book? I mean, it, it's been unbelievable. And I'm so grateful to Rose for um, for reading the book and, and saying the kind things she did. And um, a, a number of the reviews said specifically the phrase, um, something like I'll never watch movies the same way again after reading this book. And to me, that's the biggest win that if it's sort of like, like, I feel like I'm the, the guy in the matrix feeding the people the pills, like, like once you see it, you can't unsee it. But until somebody sort of points this out to you, it's very easy not to notice because it's just everything you've ever known. Um, so to me, that, that was the best feedback I got. Awesome. So let's talk about Bite Me because it is February. We're in the month of February and that means it's time for a romance. And now this is interesting because I haven't seen this pairing before. Vampire romantic comedy. <laughs> I haven't seen those three words put together. So the film focuses on a real life vampire that is audited by an IRS agent. And from conception to the final cut that was on set to the film's release, how long did it take you and your production team to release the film? Hmm. So I believe from the time I wrote the first draft to the time it first premiered was four years, I think. So wow. yeah, films take forever. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. So four years is a very long time. So what were some of the challenges that you and the Bite Me team faced throughout the filming process? And how did you guys overcome those obstacles? So, um, I mean, the first the first uh, challenge with this film was the script, because as you say, this is an unusual pairing where we were trying to do something very ambitious of bringing in. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to, to write a, a, a romantic comedy that was actually also just a good movie. Um, I love dearly the romantic comedies from the 80s and 90s that weren't just sort of fluffy rom-coms, but were smart, funny. I mean, they have that rom-com formula, but they're just objectively good movies. And so I wanted to, to write one like that again, because the genre has taken a very sad downward slide into sort of like dumb fluff land. Um, so I wanted to write a romantic comedy that was, that was a good movie. And I wanted to make it different. So, you know, it's about real, the community of real vampires, people who identify as vampires, which is a real thing, which we can talk about if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and the IRS and it's the the film is like a very complex uh, melding of like 
broad comedy and smart comedy and um, pathos. And, you know, it's it's like a very delicate thing. So so it took me 45 drafts of that script before we before I finally landed sort of like the whole thing. Um, so that was the first obstacle. And then, of course, raising the financing is always, always the big, almost always the biggest obstacle for any indie film. Um, but we just kept going and and um, there, there's there been so much support for the film from start to finish. And we got so lucky with our cast who are just to a to a person just unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, we made it happen. That's cool. I want to go back on the real vampires because this is <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing this because yeah. all I see here this is like a belly like Bella Lugosi walk around characters at Universal Studios Hollywood or in Florida or like people trying to be going hot topic and trying to channel their inner Edward and Bella. <laughs> yeah. So the the spark of this project actually happened when I was acting on the set of Boardwalk Empire, and got to chatting with one of the extras one day on set. It was a very long shoot day. And over the course of about 13 hours, she revealed to me that she identifies as a vampire. And that was my face. I was like, what? <laughs> <Come Yeah. again." laughs> uh, and, and she began explaining to me that there's actually this global community of people who identify as vampires. Now they don't believe they're supernatural. They don't think they're gonna live forever, nothing like that. But they believe that um, they need to feed on blood or energy to stay healthy. Um, so I went home and fell down the internet rabbit hole of researching this community. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of vlogs on YouTube if you wanna fall down the same rabbit hole, which I watched, um, and just became like so fascinated by that idea. Um, as you say, like vampires are a very sticky um, archetype. They always uh, sticky in like a compelling way, right? We they we can't get away from van the vampire archetype. People love it. Um, so to but to have this um, different slant on it, which is again, it's like a global community of, by some estimates, hundreds of thousands of people who I, who are part of this community, um, but it's never been presented in film before in in fictional form. Um, so I became pretty fascinated by that. And um, we've, we've had the opportunity to meet many of them now. On, uh, when we took the film on tour, many of them came. The king and queen of the Austin vampires came to the film and they loved it, um, which was amazing. And, and uh, I, it felt so good because of course, that's a community that gets a lot of mockery and a lot of um, hate. Um, and so they were very nervous when, I was, when we were making the film that we were gonna be making fun of them, which the film does not. Um, and so it was really rewarding to have them watch the film and, and feel like they'd really been represented. And I'm just glad you brought out the tour because the thing is, once the film was finished, premiered in Cinequest, the film went on a 51 screening vampire tour, 40 city vampire tour in America. So why did you and your team decide to go on this tour and how did you gain attention around the film? <laughs> um, yeah, it was the joyful vampire tour of America. Um, so uh, both my producing partner, Sarah Wharton, and I have released other indie films through more traditional um, mechanisms through distribution companies. And there's there's kind of an underwhelming experience as a filmmaker to how films are released right now, because mostly it is through digital and you don't get to meet or hear from the people who watch it. And and as an artist, there's a like that's part of the thing. <laughs> There's, you want that feedback loop. You want to see like, did this impact people? Did they laugh at my jokes? Like, you know, um, and also it's a film that's so much about community and so much about joy that it felt really wrong to just have people watch it isolated at home as the only way of watching a movie. So we, we came up with this wild idea of moving into an RV for three months. And we literally drove 13,001 miles around the country in a big loop and we did 51 screenings in 40 cities in 90 days, which wow. is bananas. Um, and uh, we, but we didn't just have screenings. Like we were in costume. We invited the audience to come in costume. We had a joyful vampire ball after every screening. Um, and, and we actually in the RV with us, living with us for three months was Kiwi Callahan, this documentary filmmaker. And she was making, um, a docu-series about the tour itself in real time. So every week she'd make a new episode about what the people we'd met, what we'd experienced that week, um, which is all on YouTube. 
if anybody wants to check it out. It's called The Joyful Vampire Tour of America. That is pretty cool because the thing is, the joy for me, I've always had nightmares of vampires, especially like a Dracula, <laughs> a Morbius, something around those kind of things. So this is very interesting to hear about this, to hear about this community of vampire of real life vampires, and it's and like, how do you think that they? I, I'm glad they perceive this. So how did they? Did they? How were? Did they share the feedback? Did they go online to do with the social media? Did they? What? What did they do to help? promote this film? They've been wonderful. Yeah. A lot of them have promoted on social media. It's also a fairly in touch, like, although again, it's like a community of maybe hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. They all kind of know each other because it's a pretty niche thing. So they've been wonderful about spreading the word um, within that community. Um, like I said, the king and queen of the Austin vampires came to our screening in Austin, Texas, where they live. They came in full vampire drag. Um, we actually have a video on YouTube of them responding to the film. Um, so, so yeah, they've been wonderful about spreading the word. And I, I, many of them have said, like, it's so exciting to have a film that actually represents their what their experience and perspective is because you know, it's kind of a complicated thing to explain to people. And they're like, now they can just go watch the movie and find out what, yeah. what our lives are like. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. And I hope the audience checks it out. Um, before I won't, before we wind up our conversation, I got to talk about the 51 fund, because as I mentioned earlier in, your, in our interaction, that is investment fund to finance films written, directed, and produced by women. So how has it grown since you and your co-founder Incept worked on it? Launch yeah, it. so um, it's a little wild that I'm involved in an investment fund, I have to say. I mean, I have an associate's degree in acting is what I have. Um, but uh, when I started talking about the women in film stuff, which really happened sort of organically out of just like speaking about what I'd experienced with it and seen within the industry, um, I ended up getting sort of on the global speaking circuit talking about these things. And at one of my talks, um, this woman, Lois Scott, who's the former CFO of the city of Chicago, uh, which I didn't know was a job before I met her, uh, just happened to be in the audience. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I've never cared about film before really. Uh, but you like in the course of this talk, you have convinced me that this is the most important lever to change the world. So like, what can I do to help? And I was like, well, basically we need money to finance films by female filmmakers. Like that's the biggest hurdle. And she's and she in that moment she said, okay, well if I do it, will you do it with me? Um, and I said, yeah, sure. Thinking I'd never hear from her again, but I did. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, so we we started working on it. And I mean, we had to really learn on our feet, and we ended up bringing on in four, two additional co-founders um, because she knew finance and I knew film, but neither of us knew film finance, and, and so we had to spend many years learning. Um, cause, cause we d don't just want to prove that women can make great art. We know that women can make great art. We want to prove that women can make films that make a financial return. Um, so to be able to do that, we had to learn a lot. Um, but I'm, but I'm so pleased to say that it's, uh, it's going so well now. Um, our film last year, Cusp premiered at Sundance and went on to be bought by Showtime, um, they're giving us a, an Oscar campaign right now. There are billboards all over LA. There's a billboard in Times Square, which is so amazing. Um, and then we've got a slate of about um, four films that we're announcing within the next couple of months that will that will be shooting this year. First of all, congratulations on that Oscar nomination race. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very impressed to see, and I really hope that my audience checks out the 51 Fun. Thank you. All right, so we gotta start winding down our conversation. So Naomi, what are some of your favorite social media apps and why do they stand out? What an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, huh. Well, it's funny. I think like everybody, I have a pretty complex relationship with social media. Um, I, I, so early on in my career, I feel like was sort of the, the good part of the Facebook trajectory. Um, where like before the algorithm sort of took everything over when you could still sort of organically build a community there, um, which I did. And I, I've often said, I don't think I could have built the career I've built without Facebook in those days because it allowed me to aggregate people um, to bring them on the journey. And if, so I both hold that love of what Facebook was while also 
being really frustrated and sad by what it's become where like you're just kind of constantly battling algorithms to try to reach the people who already want to hear from you which is really frustrating um so i'm i'm on facebook i'm on instagram i'm on twitter but i i'm i'm in i think i'm in a sort of like frustrated <laughs> face of social media and wishing that there was we could return to the time when when it was less about algorithms i totally agree i totally agree too so if you have the opportunity to meet with filmmakers who want to advance their careers in the entertainment industry, what advice will you share with them? Do not wait for anybody to pick you. Pick yourself. <laughs> Don't wait for permission and figure out how to make your movies and tell your stories. Um, because the particularly right now when, when the traditional pipelines into the industry are smaller than they've ever been before, um, the, the people I've seen succeed over time, including myself, are the ones that do not wait around, do not wait for permission, but just like, however you can make your movie, you make it. Um, and I would say, particularly for those of us who are not white men, there's an even narrower uh, door into the main industry, the, the, you know, the, the main system of the industry. And so it is, and the world needs our stories most desperately because they're the ones that have been completely missing from the cinematic universe. So like, figure it out. If you have to make your movie on an iPhone, make your movie on an iPhone. It's still better quality than films used to be at all. Um, you know, like f find a way because the world needs your stories. Okay, Naomi, I have one final question for you already. Yes. Where can my audience find Bite Me, number one? Number two, where can I find uh, your book? And also, where can I find your TED Talk and all your other stuff? Great. Um, so the easiest place to find everything is on my website, which aggregates all of the things, uh, which is just NaomiMcDougallJones.com. Um, but Bite Me um, is, as of today, available, available for pre-order on iTunes and Apple TV starting Tuesday, February 8th, it'll just in time for Valentine's Day. It'll be available also on Amazon, Google Play, and again, Apple TV and iTunes. And that's true internationally as well as here in the US. Um, and my book is available wherever books are sold. Truly, it's, you know, try not to use Amazon, but it's on Amazon or uh, indie bookstores or it's everywhere. And my TED Talk is, of course, on TED.com with all the other TED Talks. <laughs> Awesome, Naomi. Thank you so much. So, guys, if you missed an episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott Show podcast, visit our page on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Spotify, and Spreaker. It's Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott Show. J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Jacob Elliott Show. J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. Naomi, in August of this year, the blog that started all jakes.com is celebrating its 11th anniversary. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Naomi. I appreciate it. If you want to see more articles or see or, or see more hear or see more interviews or read them or even more reviews on America's Got Talent, the mass singer, head to jakes.chick.com. And guys, if you're financially able to, please consider having the PayPal to help Jakes keep Jakes Take up and running if you are financially able to. That's awesome. If you're not, I totally understand. And a good alternative is a good listen to a follow up on this podcast and also a good social media follow. Naomi, you're doing incredible things and I cannot wait to see how you grow in the future. Thank you so thank much you. for taking time on our schedule. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Until next time, thank you so much for popping in and have a great one, everybody. Goodbye.